You turn in your Old Testaments to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel 33. I'm going to look at a subject this morning that I've entitled The Warning Watchman. In the Old Testament, the Lord would designate people to be watchmen for the city. And that the whole purpose of a watchman was that he was to warn the city when uh, trouble was coming, when there were invaders, when there was difficulty. Uh, they, were the, they were the warning signal. And we're going to take a look at the first nine verses and then get right into the message here this morning. If your neighbor doesn't have a Bible, allow them to look on with you, but let's all stand right now. And look with me, if you would, in verses 1 through 9. Ezekiel 33, verses 1 through 9. Ezekiel 33, 1 says again, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword Come upon the land. He blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if but if the uh, watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. When I say unto the, unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in church this morning. Thank you for the freedom that we have. Thank you for the Bible that we have to read from. Thank you, Lord, that you speak to our hearts through it. And we pray that you do just exactly that this morning. I pray there'd be nothing in my life or my heart or my mind that would, that would hinder the proper uh, pro proclamation of the scriptures. And Father, I pray that the, this morning that our hearts would be open to you. Lord, that uh, as you speak to us this morning, we will respond. And God, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. Take the, the word of God by the spirit of God and do a work that only you can do. And we'll be careful to thank you and to praise you for what you do in our hearts. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Again, the watchman was, was a person that was designated to warn the city uh, when uh, trouble was coming, when enemies were coming to the city. And of course, um, God, God says that he has designated people to be watchmen. One of the watchmen was, was Ezekiel. He was given a message to give to Israel, and he was to be faithful with that message, and it was a message of warning. We're studying on, in fact, just finishing up, studying on the minor prophets on, on Wednesday nights, and every one of those minor prophets were designated as watchmen. Uh, they were to warn the people uh, because of the direction that the people were going, because of the trouble that was about to come upon them, because of them uh, sliding away from, from their relationship with God. And, and it, was, it was the watchman's duty 
to let them know uh, that, that there was trouble coming. Um, we've got to be reminded, I, I think, often of, of our position. If you're, if you're saved, if you, if you know Christ is your Savior, uh, then God has designated you to be a watchman. Uh, I was just told this morning by uh, Al Salvage, I believe it was, uh, told me that uh, there, he, he heard a, a figure, and whether or not this figure is correct, I don't know. I don't know how in the world you, you, could, you, you could get it exact, but uh, he heard there's approximately 800,000 believers uh, over in the nation of China. Now, China's a closed nation when it comes to the, 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 the gospel, uh, but the gospel still gets its way in there, amen? And, uh, uh, it, but it, as far as missionaries going in there and so forth, there are a few that have gone in uh, with, uh, with other occupations and have done some underground work, but there's really not a lot going on over there. But there's 800,000 at least, uh, believers that are over in China. You know what that means? That means that somewhere spread out throughout China, there's 800,000 watchmen. Now, honestly, you know, you know, I don't know what the population of China is. I just know it's huge. <laughs> it's humongous, okay? So 800,000 really isn't a lot. But those people have a tremendous responsibility. And that's the responsibility of getting the gospel to, 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 to the people of their country. The truth of the matter is, we have a great responsibility as well. How many of you believe that uh, there's a really, really, really good possibility that the blessed hope could take place, the, the rapture of the church could take place during your lifetime? Let me see your hand. I do. I, my hand's up. I mean, my hand's up. Hi, uh, I believe it could happen. But you know what that means? If the, if, the, if the rapture takes place in our lifetime and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds, then shortly thereafter or right after, the tribulation starts. And there is, there is indication in Scripture that if people have heard the, 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 the gospel beforehand, that they're going to believe a lie and not the gospel during that tribulation period. You know what that means? That means that we are set as watchmen here today. Uh, we, you know, God has set us here for a, for a reason. Uh, if, if it does take place within our lifetime... What a privilege we have. You know, we say, oh, you know, it's, it, we're in the last days. Oh, that's terrible. No, 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 no. You're looking at it from the wrong perspective. What a tremendous privilege to be the last generation, the generation to go up just before the tribulation period. That's a, that's a privilege. And I don't mean just the privilege to go up, but it's a privilege to be left here for right now so that we can tell people about Jesus Christ. That's a, that's a tremendous privilege. And, and that tells me that there's, there's two groups of people on this earth. There is those that need to be warned, and then there are the warners. And everybody here is in one of two groups. You're either the one who's supposed to do the warning, or you're the one who's supposed to heed the warning. And, and, uh, and, and listen to the gospel. Uh, I've been in both groups. If, if you're saved today, you've been in both groups. You were lost, now you're, now you're found. You were, you were dead in trespasses and sins, and now you're alive in Jesus Christ. Um, so at one time, you were the one that needed to be warned, and uh, now today you are the one who has been given the responsibility of doing the warning. What a, what a, what a, what a, a, a tremendous responsibility that is to, to be left here on this earth uh, to be able to give out the gospel to others. Uh, I've, I've, had, I've had people ask me over the years, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and thinking to intimidate me, I think, sometimes, usually by the way the question is asked, but are you, a, are you one of those? You're not one of those hellfire and damnation preachers, are you? Absolutely. Yeah. 
Absolutely, I'm guilty as charged. I am one of those hellfire and damnation preachers. Uh, why? Because a warner is supposed to warn, a watchman is supposed to warn about the coming danger. And a warner can only do just exactly that. They, they need to warn. Uh, we can't make anybody do anything, but we certainly can let them know that trouble's coming. We can let them know that hell is real. We can let them know that eternity is, is something that they're going to have to deal with. I, 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 got, I got a blessing out of the, the song that we sang just before the, the message, uh, Sweet By and By. Every time I think of the sweet by and by, I think the counter of that, and that's the nasty now and now, which is where we are. Uh, you know, uh, this is the opportunity that we have and the only opportunity that we'll have to tell people about Jesus Christ and to warn them of, of uh, the, the trouble to come. Uh, you know, it, it never, never fails. I have, I have uh, over the years, uh, where when, when hurricane season hits down south, particularly I think of Florida, uh, Florida, North and South Carolina, and those states down there, on that corridor, oftentimes they, they end up getting hurricanes, and sometimes the hurricanes are really ferocious. And the, the, the government and the, um, uh, the, the media uh, all scream and holler and tell, tell people at times, you need to evacuate a particular area. And invariably, most people do heed the warning, but some of them don't. And Again, invariably, people end up dying because they didn't heed the warning. Well, it's certainly not, not the fault of those who gave the warning. If they gave the warning and the warning was not heeded, then it's the fault of those that ignored the warning. And that's the way you've got to understand uh, our duties as, as being watchmen uh, is our job to get out the warning. You can't make a decision for anybody. You can't put conviction in anybody's heart. You can't change anybody's mind. They have, to, they have to come to themselves. They have to listen to the scriptures. They need to listen to the, the spirit of God as he convicts them of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Uh, and all those things have to take place. Uh, but, but, uh, but it is our job to, to let folks know that there is a, a hell to be shunned and an and a, and a, uh, a eternity that is coming that one day they'll have to deal with. And the Bible says, is appointed unto man once to die and after this to judgment. Now, what that means is, not only do they only have a chance on this side of, of death to, to trust Jesus Christ as, as Savior and to believe on him, but we only have, on this side of death, the opportunity to warn them. Once we're dead, we can't do anything about it. We can't do a thing. Uh, your, your opportunity is now. My opportunity is now. And you look at Scripture, and, and the, the greatest and the strongest hellfire and damnation preacher that ever lived was the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you think about, about what all he said about eternity. And he spoke more and was more descriptive about hell than he ever was about heaven. And, and, and remember, Jesus it was God in the flesh. God left heaven, came down, took on, took on human flesh. He was 100% man, 100% God, and ended up dying for our sins according to the scriptures. But, but the Bible makes it very, very clear that uh, he spent more time describing hell and warning of it than he, he spent describing heaven and, and speaking of that. Why is that? Well, because it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And Christ knew that. What, 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 are, some, what are some things that the, the Savior said uh, you, you, talk about, you talk about being a good watchman. Jesus Christ was a good watchman. And, and uh, he, he did not 
cut the message. He did not water down the message. Uh, he didn't hesitate to give the message. Uh, there, were, there were times when, uh, all, in fact, often times, uh, when he was given, it, given the message to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the religious crowd, that they totally rejected what he said. That didn't stop him from giving the message. It's not, it's not our responsibility to determine who will or will not accept it. You don't know. You have no clue. Our responsibility is to give the message. And that was, that was the way that Christ operated. Let's see how, how he warned folks. Take your Bibles and turn with me to, to uh, Mark, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, look in verses 29 and 30. Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 and 30. Verse 29 says, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. What he was saying was, he's saying that hell is worse, eternal hell is worse than any physical loss you would have down here. And if something's stopping you in your physical body from, from trusting Christ as Savior and going to cause you to die and go to hell and cut it out, cut out your eye, cut off your arm, uh, it, it'd be worth it if you could avoid hell fire for all eternity. And uh, uh, he was very, very blunt. You say, man, that's, a, that's kind of a, a, a gross way to put it. You know, cut out your eye or cut off your, your hand or your arm. Uh, no, it was serious to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and he knew that eternity was real. And so therefore, he warned him. And, and uh, uh, you know, you, you've heard people make comments like, I know I have, uh, comments like, well, you know, I, I've, just, I've just been through hell down here. No, you haven't. You have no idea. You have absolutely no idea what, what you're saying when you say that. Because hell is nothing like anything down here. Uh, you know, you say, well, boy, what I went through there, that, that, that was just hell. No, it wasn't hell. Hell is eternal. You never escape it. Um, I, I've had people say, well, I, I'm living my hell right down here. No, you're not. Hell is, is in the future. It is in eternity. And hell and the lake of fire are forever. And, and they never quit. And it never stops. Anything you have down here is temporal. And Jesus knew the difference and he warned them. Another thing, another thing that he, he warned them of or told them of. Go to Matthew 10. Matthew chapter 10. How, how many uh, of you have ever, I've, I've, even heard, uh, I've even heard saved people make this comment. Uh, God doesn't send anybody to hell. If a person goes to hell, they go to hell because of their own choice. But, but God does not send anybody anyone to hell. You ever heard that? I've heard that. I've even heard that from come out of the mouths of Christians. That's not Bible. That's not Bible. Take your Bibles and look with me in, in Matthew chapter 10 and look in verse 28. Now it is true that a person makes that decision. That, the, 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 that, that part of it's true. But to say that, that God never sends anybody to hell? No, yes he does. Yes he does. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28 it says, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's not talking about the devil. That's talking about God. God can destroy and will destroy both the body and the soul in hell. A person will be in that condition for all eternity. It's an eternal condition. It's an eternal destruction. 
And, and uh, uh, there, there's places where, where Jesus made it very clear that some people were going to come to God in eternity. And he was going to say, depart from me, ye wicked, into everlasting fire. Why would he say, depart from me into? He's sending them to hell. He sends them to hell because they have not trusted him as Savior. You say, yeah, but I thought God is love. He is love. He is love. The Bible says that, but he's also just. And you can't separate the justice from the love. In fact, because he is love, that's why Jesus left heaven, came down here, put, put up with all our junk for 33 and a half years, and then died on the cross, took the wrath of our sin, uh, the wrath of God for our sin, and took that cup and drank of it fully and became the sacrifice for our sin. You, you talk about love. That's love. He never did anything wrong, and yet he took the punishment for all the wrong that we've done. He, he, he took the full payment for our sin. And, uh, you know, don't, don't let people say, well, a loving God would not send a person. To he would send a person to hell if they would reject the loving gift that he provided for them by his own blood. Um, God can't let people who have not trusted Christ as their personal Savior into heaven. If, if, uh, if a person has not come to the point where they realize that they're a sinner and that they're on their way to hell, they're lost. And the only way they can go to heaven is by putting all their faith and trust in Christ. It has nothing to do with their baptism. It has nothing to do. I, 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 I cringe every time I go to funerals uh, where people say uh, uh, he was, so-and-so was forgiven or so-and-so was born again at, at his or her baptism. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. Uh, the scripture makes that very, very plain and very, very clear. It's by trusting Jesus Christ. It's not by going to church. It's not by being a good person. It's not by obeying the Ten Commandments. It's strictly by believing on Christ and him alone for our salvation. Go to, go to uh, Matthew 23. You're in the book of Matthew. Just go to chapter 23. And when you get to 23, look down at verse 33. Matthew 23, verse 33. It says, ye serpents, and again, this is Jesus speaking, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Uh, hell is a place of damnation, and damnation just simply means everlasting punishment. It means that, that you go on forever and ever and ever in hell. Um, you know, you, you hear some people talk, and they, they say, well, I thought, I thought uh, people uh, were just annihilated. No, the Bible doesn't teach that at all. Uh, we're going to take a look at, a, at a, a scripture here in a little bit in Luke chapter 16 where, where a person died, went to hell, and it says he lifted up his eyes in torment. He didn't just go into hell. It was like a microwave, you know, that just, that just hit him and <laughs> it just turned into dust. No, it's not like that at all. Uh, you stay in that state for all eternity. You say, that's horrible. Exactly. It is horrible. And you know why it's horrible? Because sin is horrible. Because sin is against, uh, it's a horrible act against a holy, eternal, righteous God. And so what, what punishment is due to us for that horrible sin? It's eternal punishment. And the, the opposite of eternal life is not eternal, eternal annihilation, just, just you're gone. No, it's not that at all. It's eternal punishment. It's one or the other. And, and the Bible makes it very clear. In Revelation 14 and verse 11, it says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Why? Because they're tormented forever and ever. It is an eternal torment that, that uh, can only be escaped 
through, through trusting Jesus Christ and him alone as Savior. Go to, go to the book of Mark, chapter 9. Next book is Mark, Mark chapter 9. And look with me, beginning in verse, uh, beginning in verse, verse uh, 43. Mark chapter 9 and verse 43. Verse 43 says, uh, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better it is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the, the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for them to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Three times, Jesus Christ said over, actually he's, he used the word, the fire is not quenched, or the phrase, four times, but over and over again he said, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Why did he repeat himself over and over? He's warning them. He's saying, listen, you don't want to go there. You know, you hear people say, well, I want to go to, to hell because that's where all my friends are. There's no party in hell. There's no fun in hell. There's, there's, there's no good times in hell. There's no fellowship in hell. It's a, it's a place of torment. And, and Jesus made that, made that abundantly clear and re repeated that admonition over and over and over again. Go to Luke chapter 16. Now, this is the one that I was telling you about, Luke 16. Luke 16 is, it's, it's a passage of scripture that has been greatly attacked over the years. Uh, People have called it a parable. People have called it, a, well, it was just a, an illustration that Jesus gave, but it wasn't a real thing. No, it, it, he's talking about two real people that lived on the earth. The One was named Lazarus. He was a poor man. Another man, man was not named. He was just a rich man. They both died. They both went into eternity. And notice particularly about the rich man. In verse 19, we're going to read 19 down through the end of the chapter. It says, There was a, a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores and it came to pass that the beggar died. And was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now notice what happened to the rich man. And in hell he lifted up his eyes. When? Instantaneously. He died and boom. He was put, placed right into hell. And it says, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham... Have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But, but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, 
lest they also come unto this, this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, uh, uh, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now, understand this. This, the, this story, this account, historical account, was told. The man was already dead. Both, both men were already dead. And the rich man was in hell. That was about, approximately, 2,000 years ago that Jesus said this. Where is that rich man today? Same place. Same situation. Nothing has changed. 2,000 years of torment. Can I tell you, that that's one of the reasons why I got saved. <laughs> that's why I, got, I didn't want to go there. I knew that eternity was real. I knew that hell was real. And I trusted Christ as Savior because I didn't want to go to hell for all eternity. I wanted to be with God for all eternity. And, and uh, sometimes, I don't know about you, but I get so caught up in everything, like I said before, in the nasty now and now, I forget about not only the sweet by and by, but the horrible eternity for those that have not trusted Christ as Savior. And I forget about why I've really been left here on this earth. I've been left here so I can tell other people. I've been left here because I, I have a responsibility. And I don't say that because I'm a preacher. I say it because I'm a Christian. There's a, there's a big difference there. Uh, yes, I have, I have some responsibilities as a preacher, but even if I wasn't a preacher, I still have responsibilities. It's just an ordinary, everyday Christian just like you and me. We're, just, we're the same in that respect. We're all set and left here as watchmen. And we're to warn people of a place called hell. Um, verse 23 tells us, says, In hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. That means he's got full consciousness. You know, he knows everything that's going on. But he's in torment in the flame. It's a place of torment. Torment is the, the utmost degree of misery, either of body or mind. And, and he, he has, a, he has a, a spiritual body that feels that, that torment. Um, look at verses 24 through 26. It says, and he cried, Unto, uh, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Now is God a God of mercy? Yeah, absolutely. On this side of eternity. But people that are in hell cannot access it on the other side of eternity. Is appointed unto man once to die, and after this is judgment. If they're going to get mercy, they're going to have to get it now. And that means I have a responsibility now. That means that, that people don't have a second chance. Uh, I absolutely hate, and, I, and I, I'm not, not using strong enough words when I say this, I hate the doctrine of purgatory. I hate it. I'll tell you why. Because that gives someone the false impression that they've got a second chance. There is no second chance. You either get saved this side of death or you're lost for all eternity. It's that simple. It's that simple. And, and hell is a place of torment. It's a place of no mercy. It's a place of no escape. No one ever went there and got out. Never. And it's a place of no relief. Um, it's got to be pretty bad 
when somebody says, if you could just take, if a man, if, if uh, a Lazarus could just dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. Well, if you dip your finger in water, what, what's going to happen? You might have three or four drops that will come off of that finger after you've dipped it. Three or four drops is going to give you comfort. Well, to a man who's in extreme pain, that would be some sort of comfort. I, I'm, I, I, am, I don't want anything to do with that kind of an eternity. I, I want nothing to do with that kind of lack of mercy, a lack of escape, a lack of relief. I'm thankful that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, I'll never, I, I'll never feel the flames of hell. I'll never experience any of that. But some other people will. And one of the reasons why we've been left on this earth is so that we can warn other folks. Look down in verses 27 through 31. It says, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him, speaking of Lazarus, to my father's house. Now Lazarus is already dead. He's not going to come back. And, and uh, verse 40, it says, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. In other words, they've got the Bible. They've got the word of God. They've got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. How do you know that? Well, because God sent his own son God, in, God came down in fleshly form, and they crucified him. So they're certainly not going to listen to somebody else who's, who's risen from the dead. Uh, they're not. And, and the truth of the matter is he died for our sins and then rose again the third day, and people are still rejecting him over and over and over again. And, and so he said they, they've got to listen to Moses and the prophets. Okay, here's the other question, though. How are they going to get Moses and the prophets? How are they going to get the scriptures? How are they going to get the New Testament? How are they going to get whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? How are they going to hear? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's only one way they're going to hear it. They're either going to, they're either going to find it themselves, which it, it happens, but not very often, or... A watchman's going to tell them. A watchman's going to tell them. And that's, that's our job as watchmen. Get, take your Bibles and turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. Revelation 21, look down in verses 8 and 9. This is looking into eternity. It says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Uh, what you got going on there is... Th you got people, you got death and hell being thrown into the lake of, lake of fire. That's the, the final resting place. Uh, people say, well, are you people ever going to be able to get out of hell? Yeah, they get out of hell to go to the lake of fire. That's, that, that's no respite. That's, that's, that's no relief. That's, in fact, honestly, I, I, personally, I think that's where the... the Partly where the, the saying of going from the frying pan into the fire comes from. That's really what you're doing. You're going from hell to the, the, the lake of fire uh, for all eternity. Um, the Bible makes it, makes it real clear that uh, uh, there is absolutely no escape. And every person that has not trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, uh, that's where they're going to head. Now, the truth of the matter is you've got, you got some people that are on this earth right now. They've been warned and they've shunned the warning. There's folks that are, that are lost. 
that if they don't repent and believe on Christ, they're going, they're going to spend eternity in hell. Some of those people have been told. Some of those people haven't been told. The, the day that I was told about salvation was the first time I'd ever heard the plan of salvation that anybody had ever... It was the first, first time I'd ever gotten a gospel tract. It was the first time, and I was 17 years old at the time, it was the first time I ever heard the plan of salvation. I'd never heard it before, never heard it before. I knew some of the, some of the basics, but I never heard it as the plan of salvation. I, I knew about heaven, I knew about hell, but I had wrong views of that because of the background that I had and because of the church that I had gone to. But, but the, 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 the truth is, until then, I, 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 I never had anybody approach me. Since I had gotten saved, since that day, I'm only one time can I remember, and it was here in, in, uh, in Auburn, uh, only one time have I ever been given a gospel track. I was, I was doing a morning walk, and uh, a lady came from across the street, and she came up to me and gave me a gospel track. And, uh, and I thanked her for it. I, didn't, I wasn't, you say, weren't you insulted? Absolutely not. I was thrilled. Uh, and, and she did what she was supposed to do. She, you know, she gave me a warning. Take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 3. And this is, a, this is a concept that not only do the lost need to get a hold of, but as saved people, I think, we need to, we need to be reminded of. John chapter 3, of course, that's where John 3.16 is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But oftentimes we don't focus on the verses following that. And verse 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In other words, the whole reason why he came was to seek and to save that which was lost. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. If a person trusts Christ as Savior, there is no, non, uh, there is no condemnation. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, because he's on this side of death, he's still got a shot. He's still got an opportunity to, to believe on Christ. But we need to understand, we need to realize that most of the folks that we come in contact with, I'd say 95% plus, maybe, maybe closer to 98, 99% of the people that we come in, they're not saved. Not only are they not saved, but they've never heard it. Can you imagine being born in America with as many Christians as there are in America, Bible-believing Christians, and they've never heard the plan of salvation. The reason why that is is because as watchmen, sometimes we don't do our job. We don't do our job. Now, you're in one of those two groups. Which group are you in? Are you in the group that has trusted Christ and is not condemned? Or are you in that group that is condemned already? If you're condemned already, then you're part of the group that needs to be warned. And that's what I'm doing this morning. I'm telling you, uh, you need to trust Christ as Savior. If you're part of the group that's been saved, praise the Lord for that. But we have a responsibility. And, and you know, I'm not here to browbeat you. I'm not here to, to hit you over the head. I'm here just to... I, I need to be reminded of the fact that I have a responsibility to people I come in contact with on a daily basis. It's not just a church visitation. It's not just in the summer when we, when we go door to door. It's not just VBS. It's not just special, special emphasis night. You know, um, it, it was, it was, it's been brought up, and, and, I, and I agree completely with this. Um, I, I, I miss seeing people walk the aisle trusting Christ as Savior. But you know what else I miss? I miss hearing about individual Christians winning other people to Christ or at least witnessing to people. It's happening less and less 
And the truth of the matter is, it needs to happen more and more because we're running out of time, folks. We're running out of time. We get so entangled and so caught up in our everyday lives, we forget about eternity. We forget about that verse that says, He that believeth not is condemned already. But he doesn't have to be. Maybe he's condemned already because he's never heard the gospel. Maybe he's condemned already because I have never told him. You know, are, are you a warning watchman? Are you a warning watchman? And there's two ways you can do that. And, and we ought to do both ways, okay? It's not one or the other, it's both of them. Number one, uh, we can verbally warn them. We can tell them. And, and, I, and I realize you don't, you don't just blat it out, you know? You wait for, a, for an opportunity and you try to work it into conversations and so forth. I understand all that. Uh, but, but we have a responsibility to warn folks. And then secondly, uh, we can... If you, if you can't give them a verbal, you can give them a warning notice. You say a warning notice? What in the world? What, what in the world is a warning notice? You know what a warning notice is? Warning notice is one of these things. That's a warning notice. You know what bothers me in this church? I go past that track, those we've got two track racks. I mean, we're not, we're not just a spiritual church with a track rack. We're a super spiritual church because we got two track racks. Um, but uh, I, Brother Sam Gipp made a good comment the other night. He said, I can tell something about the spiritual temperature of the church when I walk in the church, and, and if there is a track rack, I know they're concerned about souls, and if there is no track rack, then they're not, and that bothers me. Yeah, it would bother me too. But you know what else bothers me is when these things don't move. You know, you make it too easy for the penners. We make it too easy. Uh, those, are, those are left out. Listen, these things cost money. I don't care. I, you know, if we have to spend several thousand dollars, whether it be these or whether it be the other ones. You say, well, I don't prefer chick tracks. I prefer, I don't care what you like or don't like. Just grab some. You know, do you have them on you? I, I had my, my son Jason has gotten into leather work. And uh, he just does, does something I used to do in day camp when I was a kid. Uh, boondoggling, we used to call it. I don't think they call it that anymore, but whatever. He calls it, oh, no, Dad, it's leather work now. It's leather work. But uh, he made me a track pack. So I can take tracks and stick them in there, stick them in my back pocket, and, uh, and I can have that, you know, to, to pass out tracks throughout the day. Uh, I'm thankful for that. Uh, I, and I'll be honest with you. I don't pass them out as much as I, as I should. I'm preaching this message as much for me as I am for you. We need to be reminded of who we are. We're watchmen. Death is coming. You've only got a little time left. You know, you think about this. If you're saved, 5,000 years from now, What's your life going to look like? <laughs> it's going to look like a drop of water in, a, in, a, in the ocean. It's going to look like nothing. And, and that's, that's really how much time we have. It's almost a blink of an eye. That's why the, the Bible says uh, a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Why? Because he lives in eternity. And someday we're going to look back and we're going to say, man, I did not have much time, and I wasted it. Understand that de the death is coming, and that heaven and hell are real. And people are going to go to one place or another. And eternity is in your future, and eternity is in the future of other people's lives. And, and you may be, and I may be, the only link that they have. Let's make sure that we're the watchmen that God has set us out to be. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, thank you for reminding this preacher of the fact that 
Death is real. It is appointed unto man once to die. After this is the judgment. He that believeth not is condemned already. And we can, we can say that, push that in somebody's face. But the truth of the matter is, that ought to bother us, even if we're saved. Because it's not talking about us, it's talking about other people. And the only link between you and those other people, oftentimes, is us. You were gracious to put somebody in our path, to put a track in our hands, to tell us about Jesus Christ and about salvation's plan. The Father... Now the responsibility, the baton, so to speak, has been passed on to us. Father, I pray that you'd help us and help us to be determined to, this morning to be the, the kind of witness that we're supposed to be. There may be someone within the sound of my voice here this morning who's not saved. And they, they're not absolutely positive. Father, if I wasn't absolutely 100% lead pipe cinch positive, that when I die and I go to heaven, I wouldn't leave this building until I got that thing settled. And it's just that simple. Just believing that we're a sinner on our way to hell, we need to be rescued. And the only way we can be rescued is by trusting and believing in the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from all sins. Trusting in your death, your burial, your resurrection, and Father, when we, when we believe on Christ and we call out to you for mercy, immediately you save our soul. Boy, what a blessing that is. God, please work on this invitation. Work on those that need to be warned. They might, someone might come forward this morning, take my hand and say, Preacher, I need to get saved. I, 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 I need to get that thing settled. I want to get that thing settled. It'll be a pleasure to put them with someone and have them show them how they can have eternal life now. But Lord, also work on our hearts that, that are saved and help us to realize we are watchmen. And we, we, we have a duty to perform. And folks are relying on us whether they, whether they even know it or not. God, you've been gracious to us. Help us to take that graciousness that's been given to us and pour it out on others. Bless this invitation, work in our hearts. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together. Let's stand with heads bowed, with eyes closed, invitations open, altars open. God's working on your heart. Maybe you've let things slip a little bit. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not absolutely positive that if you were to die, you'd go to heaven. You want to get that thing settled, come see me. We'll have someone take the Word of God and show you how you can get that thing taken care of for all eternity. But in whatever way God might be working on your heart this morning, now's the time. You come.